All right. Um, whoops. I'm Eric Halfacre. And I'm Jenna Halfacre. And uh, we're actually representing the Last Frontier Adventure Club. Um, it's an outdoor group that's uh, dedicated to trip planning resources um, and getting those available to the public. And uh, we're going to be talking, or talking about hiking the Stampede Trail today. And uh, originally what got us interested in, in going out there in the first place was uh, I'm old enough to just barely remember when this was in the news. Uh, and then um, after that, obviously, Krakauer came out with the book in 96, and then Sean Penn made his movie in 2007. And uh, we didn't do our trip until 2009, so it was all those things combined. And uh, we kind of wanted to just get out there and uh, understand kind of the challenges that he faced. And um, there's, there's definitely, you know, when we first heard the story, it was kind of this gut reaction of, you know, wow, I can't believe that he did that. And uh, that, that seems like kind of a, a dumb way to go. Um, and so we wanted to go out there and see what it was really like out there before we judge him too harshly. So uh, we wanted to go out and see the place. And so we had to plan our trip. And uh, of course, in 2009, we, uh, we were looking on the internet and, and trying to find information on it. We couldn't find anything. We, there was no, no map file. Um, there was a map that showed the area, but it didn't show where the bus was. Um, click forward onto that. Um, actually, let's go back to that slide for just a second. Uh, but the, the Healy Chamber of Commerce had this site up that, that said specifically, basically, don't go. <laughs> um, and I thought that was kind of funny because uh, obviously it, there's some dangers involved in it and uh, it can kill you and it has killed somebody at this point. But that's true of an awful lot of hikes in Alaska. And uh, so I didn't see any reason not to go if we didn't prepare ourselves adequately first. Um, the bus is out at the end of the, the Stampede Corridor, which is this notch out of Denali National Park, basically, um, that uh, covers the Wolf Townships and, and Stampede Trail. And um, you actually briefly cross into Denali National Park right before you cross the Tequanica River, but for the vast majority of the trail, you're, you're outside of the park. And uh, so we knew that, and we saw this kind of dotted line that was barely showing up there is the Stampede Trail on the USGS map. And um, since it's labeled Stampede Road pretty much the whole way, uh, we just assumed that we would be able to take our vehicle all the way to the Savage River and start it, which would have made the trip 14 miles one way and 28 miles round trip. So we told all of our friends that we were going to do this 28 mile round trip weekend hike. And uh, we got all these people to go with us. Uh, Jeremy actually just showed up, so now we got one of them with us. And, uh, we were all kinds of underprepared, really. Um, we were all wearing <laughs> cotton, and our packs were all way too heavy. She was carrying 16 pounds of water because she didn't trust filters. Uh, that guy had 50 shotgun shells for the army of bears he planned to encounter. Um, so yeah, we were all kinds of ready for this thing. And uh, so we were all kind of startled to realize that our start point uh, had to move a, a long, long ways because uh, our friends encountered a large puddle immediately after Eight Mile Lake, uh, ran into it, sucked water into the engine, uh, hydro-locked it, and, and that, was, that was the end of our forward progress with the vehicles. So that changed the trip to 20 miles each direction and a 40 mile round trip. Um, and we decided to go ahead and go for it anyway, which had uh, different effects on different people. Uh, all my friends think I'm a liar now because <laughs> I told them it was going to be 28, and it was actually 40. And uh, that guy ended up in ankle braces for a couple of the days afterwards. They had to rebuild the engine on their car, and his <laughs> sister had to get surgery on her leg. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, uh, so when we came back, we didn't want anybody to repeat uh, our our adventure, at least without a little more information. And so. Um, we made this video called Hiking the Stampede Trail, uh, What to Know Before You Go. This was 2010 when we put it out the year after the hike. And it's 10 minutes long, so I'm not going to put you through all that since you're here for the presentation. Anyway, but I'll, I'll give you a quick sample here. My first thought was that I felt very accomplished for having hiked 40 miles, or 20 miles in, I guess. But... Uh, 
after a few minutes, it, it kind of set in that Chris you know, himself had made the bus his resting place, his final resting place, in search of soul and purpose to life. So it's a very powerful message. And it took a while for it to finally sink in after hiking so long, but the message was still there. When I stepped in the bus, I got goosebumps all over. I, it was unlike anything before to have walked that far and then finally made it. To see everything just like it was in the movie, it was unreal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like you're stepping into somebody else's life and stepping into this bus and just knowing that kid came out here and, and trying to fulfill his dream and then and died in the process. It's, it, it was very, very moving for me. So that, that video, uh, immediately there was really an overwhelming response to that. And right now, I think we're at like 84,000 views or something on that. <laughs> and uh, for a while there, well, during every summer, I get about 10 emails a day from people uh, asking questions. And uh, eventually, I, I wanted to, oh, and, and we started getting some press contacts, people asking questions, asking if they could use our video for different things, or sections of our video. and. Uh, I wanted to address a lot of these questions. Actually, what it was is I got tired of answering the same questions over and over again. <laughs> and uh, so we, we built a website um, to answer most of those questions in, in detail. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that we did is we put up uh, a full map file um, that you could download, open in Google or throw it on your GPS, whatever. And uh, now there's a, an accurate track and it shows you where you can start and where, where the bus is located. Um, and then the other thing that we did is uh, we threw a bunch of articles about, about various things, things that you should bring, other people's trips, uh, river crossing techniques. Uh, and then Chris's sister actually wrote us a letter uh, to attach uh, to the site asking people uh, a couple of things. One, to be respectful and not vandalize it once they got there, which is a real issue. And two, not to go out there if it's not within your capabilities, because every single time somebody goes out there underprepared and gets rescued, it makes it that much more likely that things can get yanked out of there so people can't go to it anymore. Um, which is something that I, I personally hope to prevent, so, so we put that up there. Um, through that, actually, uh, we realized that uh, a lack of good information and map files on trails in Alaska was not unique to Stampede Trail. Uh, it's most trails. And so um, we started trying to map every single trail. And uh, we've done about 30 so far. And, uh, that's that's our ongoing project. Um, so we're going to walk through the hike, kind of from the beginning out to the bus. Uh, take a few steps. And uh, the trail begins at Eight Mile Lake. Hey everybody, I am uh, here at Eight Mile Lake, and I'm about to start hiking down the Stampede Trail. Um, it's kind of windy, but it's about 50 degrees. It's pretty nice. Uh, I got a heavy pack because I'm carrying some gear out for a later expedition. Uh, and I'm going to get hit in the trail now. And uh, that's 8 Mile Lake on the map there. Um, from that portion, for the first five miles of the trail, uh, it's actually heavily used by, by Jeeps, Argos, and uh, four-wheelers that are all part of uh, guided tours and it's gotten so rutted up that uh, unless you have a high clearance for it before you're not going to be able to get through that section as, as we discovered. Um, that's changing. The, the company that runs that Jeep tour has actually uh, secured a permit to fix what, what they broke basically and they're going to level that back out and make that more passable. Uh, that's supposed to happen I think sometime in the next couple of years. Um, all of their camps are located about four and a half to, to five miles in. And uh, like I say, so lots of traffic on that section. Um, pretty easy going. I mean, you can, you can find a high spot and get around most of the mud when you're walking or biking. But from there, uh, Fish Creek kind of winds through the trail and becomes the trail. And uh, it's at this part where basically give up on having dry feet. Um, it's not going to happen. And uh, don't wear waterproof boots because you're just going to fill them full of water and then they'll hold the water in the rest of the trek. Uh, something that will drain is, is going to be a lot better. So I just passed uh, the Jeep camp and talked to Mike Kramer for a minute there. And I uh, come around the corner and 
has this sign somebody put up letting you know how far the bus is. So, got quite a ways to go if I'm going to make it there tonight. Oftentimes, uh, Stampede Trail is really more like Stampede Creek. So trying to hike this and keep your feet dry is really just an exercise in futility. Immediately after that, you come to this like, field that's just super muddy. Um, it would seem like you could pick her up through that that would keep you from getting like up to your knees in mud on foot. But uh, if it's been raining much lately, it's, it's not that way. Uh, you even step off into the grass and you just kind of keep right on in. Um, and to, to illustrate how muddy it is, uh, that is a pickup with 54 inch tires on it, sunk down to its frame. And uh, there's a sign there that says four by four vehicles not recommended to go past this, but I know that guy and he does not care. Um, after that, there's a big series of beaver ponds. Um, and most of the people that I've talked to that have gone out there, beavers are about the only wildlife they've seen. Uh, either that or that moose. I've only talked to a couple of people who've ever seen bear. I've seen plenty of bear sign, but I have not seen a bear. So they're there, but uh, apparently they're camera shy. There's a beaver in the beaver pond. Oh, there he goes. So after the beaver ponds, um, Cross Fish Creek one last time, and it's a really slow moving creek, but it's deep. It's probably like knee deep. Uh, and maybe from me to the wall across. Uh, there's not really like a current there you have to worry about. You're just going to get a little bit wet. Um, you cross there, and it's maybe another mile or so before you reach uh, the Savage River, which is the first of two river crossings that you encounter on the trail. Um, the Savage River is, is definitely smaller than the Tech. Um, I mean, it, it goes up and down. They both fluctuate a lot because they're glacially fed, but uh, it's rarely uncrossable by foot. Okay, so we have just reached, well, I'm alone, so I've just reached the Savage River, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and cross it here in a second. Let's go over there, take a look, see how the water is, but I want to show you guys something first. This is a memorial that's set up for Claire Ackerman, who drowned uh, trying to cross the Teklanika River uh, back in 2010 and uh, I'm just showing this to you guys for those of you that aren't aware that uh, you can can die on this hike and it needs to be taken seriously and uh, it's really a, a tragedy what what happened to her um, so let's let's try and, and not let that happen to anybody else Okay, Savage River looks a little bit higher than the last time I was here, but nothing too terrible. It's kind of brown, which means it's probably running kind of high and eroding the banks upstream. I am safely on the other side. It wasn't too bad. It was just a little bit below knee high. And now on to the Teklanika. So the Savage River crossing is... Uh, it's actually about one and a half miles before the Teklanika crossing. And right north of the trail there, those two rivers come together. Um, the the Teklanika is a much more substantial river. Um, it's wider and deeper uh, and faster probably too. Um, not colder though, they're both pretty cold. But, uh, and as you saw in that, that clip at the Savage River, the reason the memorial is at the Savage River is because uh, when her mom went out to, to set the memorial, uh, they, the Savage River was so high that her mom, for obvious reasons, didn't want to cross it. And so they, they set it back, so it's a mile and a half from the tech. But this is uh, Claire Ackerman. In 2010, uh, she was traveling out there with uh, a guy from France, and she's from Switzerland. They were traveling together. And uh, they had actually crossed the Teklanika once successfully, and they were crossing back over it. And uh, when they came back, what happened is uh, somebody had tied a rope across the river, which, um, as far as crossing techniques go, you can hold on to a rope and cross a river. Uh, you just got to know that if your feet get swept out, that you got to let go, and you got to be able to get off of it. Well, she wrapped a rope around her and tied it onto the rope. And so, and so did 
the guy that she was traveling with. And so when, I'm not sure which one, but one of the other of them got knocked down, which pulled the rope taut, knocked the other one of them down. And uh, the French guy was, was able to cut himself loose from the rope, but then he washed downstream. By the time he got out, came back up and was able to cut her off the rope. Uh, she was already gone. And uh, he went downstream quite a ways with her, got her to the bank. Somebody, I think, either saw the thing happen or came across it soon thereafter, called the troopers, and they came in. And uh, there was just nothing that anybody could have done for her at that point. Uh, the thing to take from that, then, is absolutely under no circumstances tie into a rope uh, when, you're, when you're crossing. You can use it for stabilization, but there's actually better methods still. Uh, but tying it into it, it just, it just anchors you in the middle of the, the water, and you're held under, and you can't get back up. Um, so I really wanted to, to emphasize that point. This is the Teklanika River. And uh, it actually, I mean, it's moving right along up there. It, it looks pretty splashy, but it doesn't really look that deep. Um, I'm not going to wade across it, though. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and use the raft. Um, and because I'm using the raft, I need to find a place where I can easily beach myself on the other side. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go up, and there's kind of a trail off to the left there uh, that goes around and further upstream. And I'm going to take that and see what it's like upstream. So the river was a little bit higher uh, today than last time I was here. And so um, you can actually see where the braids come together down there, but there's like another braid through the woods there and uh, I crossed that one which was really swift um, I just went screaming down it in the pack raft thought I was gonna roll once and then uh, this one here I don't think it's actually too deep but uh, I didn't find a place I mean it's all cut bank up there and I didn't find a place to beach the boat until right here so I kind of lost most of my upstream progress. So uh, what I did there is um, I crossed with the pack raft and if you want to grab the lights we'll show this one off a little bit. Um, this is a, a Yukon Yak uh, from Alpaca and the thing weighs without the spray deck on it the way it's shown here about six pounds when uh, you roll it up. Um, you know, six, you said six? Six, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. you inflate it with basically a nylon garbage bag with a nozzle on the end. And uh, so you don't have to carry a pump or anything. You just and then push the air through, hopefully closing this in a little better. But you do that a few times and it fills right up. Um, then this paddle is a carbon fiber handle fiberglass plates and breaks down into four pieces and the whole thing fits either on or in your pack um, and I mean that all of that together is probably about seven pounds which is a lot really uh, for in terms of adding that much weight to your pack for backpacking but uh, especially if you're gonna carry it 40 miles but it's almost foolproof insurance I mean you're never gonna get to that river when it's so deep that you can't cross it with one of these uh, whereas if you go out there in July, there's probably a good 25% chance that one way or the other it's going to be too deep to walk across. And uh, I mean, at a certain point, it doesn't matter how good you are. I mean, like when you can hear the boulders rolling along the bottom, you're going to get knocked down and have to swim if you try and walk it. And uh, that's where probably 99.9% .9 of the rescues come from is people go out there and they get to the river and it's low enough that they're able to cross it. They hike another 20 miles, they're a little bit more fatigued, the rivers come up a little bit and uh, stays hot for a few days, the glacier's melting, they can't get back across. Somebody spots them on the other side, calls the troopers, they come in, helicopter them out, and then they get their names in the newspaper and they get to be really embarrassed. And, uh, this takes care of that, it doesn't happen to you anymore. Um, Question. Yes. Did you have a sort of a, a sort of a like vest or? Um, there's a whole bunch of ways of. What would you be carrying? Uh, I take my thermarest and wrap it around me and put it under the raincoat and cinch it, okay. which is not an approved PFD, but it does work. I've tried it. 
but I'm not recommending it. Yeah. There's also water this river at all? What's that? Any rapids, white water that you have to worry about? Um, the runout from this location is pretty good for quite a ways. I scouted that out, but there is, and that other braid uh, down a little bit. There is a spot where the two braids come together, and there's probably like a class two rapid there. So, um, so yeah, I just made sure that I was far enough upstream that I had plenty of time to react if anything happens. And did you practice quite a bit on smaller streams with your little mm -hmm. back wrap? Um, in fact, I've got a clip that's next. Next frame we can go to. Uh, Knicker, not on the Stampede Trail. But uh, this is us uh, crossing the Knick River, which is not smaller, it's just slower. Uh, and this is a different trip. We were hiking up to the glacier from one side. Um, and they, they work real well for that. We've got a diagram here. Um, in something like that where it's moving moderate speed, you just kind of angle upstream and to the shore that you want to go at about a 45 and uh, paddle like hell. And you want to scout out a spot where you've got an eddy to start in and an eddy to end in. Well, you, how you define an eddy for those who don't know? What's that? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, that's a spot where there's some kind of obstacle breaking the current and there's a, a still spot in the water. Um, and I mean, you can see them like there. There's a glassy spot on the far side, which that would be a, a, actually a fairly difficult one to aim for. But there were a couple more that are off to the right in this shot. I think one of them that I actually landed in. Um, so you're you're trying to start somewhere where there's a little bit of a break in the current, because getting into water that's moving that fast, you know, if you just slide off the bank into it, um, and you're not real experienced at doing that, you're more likely than not just going to roll. Um, whereas if you start with your nose up into the current. You know, it'll peel you away, and uh, then you can paddle off at a, at a 45. And if it's strong enough, you can turn around. And then you need a lot more space to, to cross in, but you can paddle across downstream at a 45 as well. Uh, you just don't want to paddle straight across. Because if you paddle straight across, you're increasing the likelihood of getting thrown by something and rolled. Um, and that is absolutely the number one way that I would recommend try and get across that river, unless you're going in the middle of the winter and you're just going to walk across it when it's frozen. Uh, but you can cross it by foot. This is our 2009 trip. And there I'm just using a, a stick and going very slowly. And you should wear shoes. Shame on that guy. But This is all set about 1 o'clock in the morning on like June 10th or something like that. So uh, the cooler it is, the lower the water is going to be. And then this is another video of one of the braids uh, that I crossed on foot when I was coming back last summer. <laughs> and uh, it was substantially higher that trip. And uh, I should have inflated the raft. I had the raft with me, but I did not. Well, I am back on the Healy side of the Teklanika. I'm um, right in the middle uh, of this channel here. It picked me up and moved me down a few feet, but I was able to regain my footing and then get into that little eddy there uh, off of that clump of weeds and crap and uh, made it out. But that was, being absolutely alone out here, that was uh, really terribly nerve-wracking. Question. Um, yes. What kind of year was this video taken? Uh, this is actually May 30th or something. Okay. So there's, there's no, like if you go on a specific date, there's not this guarantee of river height. I mean, uh, I've seen pictures, when we recommend going is uh, like beginning to mid-September. And... Um, I've seen a lot of pictures of people who just walk right across. I've seen pictures of people take a four-wheeler across with water just barely up to the hub. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we saw a video from last year where some German guys got stuck on the other side and sat there for five days waiting for it to come down in mid-September. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it there is no guarantee, but uh, you can certainly you can certainly aim for times where you're more likely to be safe. Um, and ultimately, I mean, the thing to remember is that. Uh, for everybody in this room, I'm assuming that you're all from Alaska or 
up here for a while. Uh, this isn't, you know, you can go out there and if it doesn't pan out for you, you turn around and go back. Well, what's really hard is for people that they come from Germany or Switzerland or some other place and they pay all this money to get here and they get up there and this is their one chance at it and they get to the Teklanika and it's too swollen and they shouldn't be trying to walk across it and they didn't bring a raft. But uh, they decide to go for it anyway because they've got stomach fever and they don't want to waste all that money. And so they do and they get themselves into trouble. Um, you know, I've known quite a few people that have done this and other hikes and seen the river and said, no, I'm sorry, i got to turn around. And uh, you just got to remember that, I mean, the bus is neat, but it's not that exciting. There's nothing worth dying out there for. <clears throat> but talking about uh, river crossing techniques on foot, um, that little stick guy there is using the tripod method. He's got, he's facing upstream, um, and he's got both of his feet firmly planted, and he's using a stick, and he's maintaining two points of contact at all time uh, on the way across. And that's the way to do it if you're alone. Uh, there's a, a number of methods uh, to use if you're in a group, um, but the one that we've used and has worked pretty successfully for us is line everybody up from biggest to smallest, and uh, biggest person breaks most of the current. Everybody along the way down is experiencing less force uh, from the river because there's somebody upstream causing a small eddy. And uh, you hold a pole, like you know, a spruce pole or something, all the way across, just a, you know, a little bit lower than chest level. And if anybody anywhere along that thing stumbles just a little bit, everybody all the way along that is able to then stabilize them and they leverage is kind of working in your favor there. Mm -hmm. um, there's other methods uh, people use where like they link arms and uh, I don't have diagrams for any of the other methods but this is this is the one that is my personal favorite for, for crossing in a group. Um, and talking about crossing and talking about rescues, uh, right now there's a, a, a project that uh, we're just in the beginning investigative stages of um, where we're looking at the possibility of putting a small suspension bridge across, uh, maybe in that location, maybe in another location. Um, but what's happening is these rescues cost uh, anywhere from uh, what uh, our buddy that uh, is a representative from, from Sitka, he just did a request for information and we found out that it's, it's anywhere between basically about 600 bucks and like $5,000 is what it's costing, depending on whether or not a helicopter gets in the air, basically, to go out and rescue these people. And almost every single one of the rescues is right there in that one spot, because they're just stuck on the other side and they can't come back. Uh, I'm paying for those in the end. State they charging the class? Yep. That's not yet. What's that? Not yet. Not yet. I don't think it's ever gonna happen. Uh, I have mixed feelings on that. I can certainly see why it should happen, but I don't think it's um, I don't think they're ever going to start charging people for it. Uh, in my in my mind, they should, but uh, like I say, I don't, I don't see that actually happening. But this, uh, if it gets built, um, I mean, the people that are on board with this right now, obviously, the, the family of the girl that drowned is the ones who are spearheading this. Um, Chris's sister, Corrine, is on board with this. Uh, representative from Sitka, Jonathan Christ Tompkins. Uh, him and he's uh, in conversations with the, the representatives from the Healy District about it as well. How much and, will it cost? Uh, well, we know how much it'll cost to find out how much it'll cost. That's the stage we're at. You know, like a footbridge or a vehicle transport? Footbridge. It would be like 20 to 30 inch deck planks. Um, in fact, I stole Trevor's photo and didn't ask for permission, so hopefully it doesn't hurt me here. But, uh, but there's, there's a bridge that's kind of in line with the thinking. Um, it might be a little bit, maybe a few more ropes in there to not fall between, but, but something along these lines. Basically, it's to allow foot traffic, uh, people with, with mountain bikes, but uh, one of the big concerns that people uh, in that area have is the amount of motorized traffic out there, especially during hunting season. They want to keep it minimal, um, so they don't want a bridge big enough to go forward or pass. Uh, so those are the conversations that are, that are going on right now. Uh, if this ever gets built, it's going to be probably two or three years. When you're fording the river, do you keep your uh, pack buckled in front and chest strap on? No, um, absolutely, yeah. Unbuckle all your straps so that if you do fall in, you can get away from your pack. Um, that's a good point. I brought that up. So, not to the 
was broken. That's true. So after uh, after the Teklanika, the trail dries out a lot. Um, if you're going to put on new socks, now's the time. And uh, you got 10 miles from there to the bus, and there's only a couple of little stream crossings. Uh, it tends to be kind of long and a little bit monotonous after that for a while. So just encountered the first bear tracks that I've seen on the trail. Um, they're not too huge. I mean, there's the, the can of bear spray compared to the palm of the track. So hopefully I don't get eaten. We are looking back down the trail towards the Teklanika River Valley. I'm using it as an excuse to take a breather because I'm going to try to make it all the way to the bus tonight, but I am getting tired already, so I'm going to have to keep pushing. Okay, so I am stopping here to take a little breather before I go the last. To be honest, I think it's like five or six miles still to the bus, but after as far as I've gone, there's no way I'm stopping yet, but man, it is just absolutely beautiful out here. And I think it's about 10.30 or 11 o'clock. I haven't really looked at the, uh, the watch in a while. I've been yelling, hey bear, this whole time. And so far, this is the only wildlife that I've seen. Hey, bunny. Yeah, after about 18 miles, that guy kind of like jumped through some brush and it was pitch black and I drew my bear spray on, but I decided to let him go. <laughs> so yeah, like I say, it gets pretty long and monotonous. And this is right here, we're about two miles from the bus. And uh, we're checking the map because we feel like we should already be there. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a GPS. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. In. How close are we now? <laughs> um, but the bus is really the end of the trail during the summer. The trail uh, on a map, it shows it going all the way out to Stampede Mine, which is like another 20 miles uh, on the other side of the Toe Cloud River. Uh, but it does in the winter, dog sledders run it. Um, but during the summer, past the bus, the trail was completely overgrown because that's where people are going. They're going there and turning around. Um, so that's realistically the end of the trail. Uh, and once you get there, you're at the bus. We got a couple of clips of that. This is from our Here we are. We were 2009 trip. Bus. It's got the time to crawl on top. So here it is, that's the bus. Um, and I can honestly say I am happier to see it this time, uh, even than I was last time because I just walked 20 miles and I am absolutely dead and uh, I need to lay down. Okay, so it's morning and uh, the bus is very, very torn up. Um, but I spent the night here last night and now I'm going to go and uh, filter some water and get something to eat. So this is the uh, Sushana River here. And I've got my water now and I'm going to go make some top ramen. That's uh, bus 142. Um, that's our picture from 2009. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about how it looks a little bit different now. 
Uh, these are some pictures actually that I got from a lady uh, named Mickey Hines, and her father, Jess Mariner, was actually the one who converted bus 142 into living quarters for his family while he was working for the Utan Construction Company. Um, and so they would just drag the bus along to where they were working on the road, and that's where his family lived during the summer of 62, uh, I think it was. Uh, that's a picture of um, Mickey down there in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, there's actually some pretty incredible stuff. These are all stills from 8 millimeter footage, so she has a video of all this. So the dragon was a cat? Right? Yes, yeah, they were drug in. Uh, there was a total of four buses, and three of them were hauled, they were being hauled out in a bus train. Um, and 142 broke its axle exactly where it is right now. So uh, it went from being part of their train to a wilderness shelter immediately and stayed there ever since. But uh, yeah, that some pretty credible and stuff she's got there. I mean, stuff that you couldn't possibly get away with now, like she has pictures of her pet bald eagle. And uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> cool. <clears throat> yeah, we actually met up with her when we were in Arizona. She happened to be in Arizona too, and got to look at a bunch of the footage. Um, Things have changed a lot out there just in the last few years. That's 2009 up there, and this is like two weeks ago right there. A uh, bunch of bullet holes, a bunch more smashed up glass. Um, it's unfortunate, but, and you know, people have talked about, well, we could designate it a, a historic landmark or something to that effect, but it's 20 miles from, you know, the end of the nearest road, so I don't think we're gonna be able to stop vandalism. Um, but like I say, the, the vandalism seems to come in waves after the rescues. Mm -hmm. And where the public opinion, uh, at least you know, exciting that, that element, saying, you know, oh, we're gonna talk about the bus again, you know, where Chris died, and people feel like Chris was an idiot, and so they gotta go out there and, and show how they feel by putting it in the side of the bus with the gun. Um, and it's unfortunate, but that is what it is. Uh, next, I've got some slides of people who uh, successfully made it out to the bus. And my point in showing that all like that is that uh, for every person who gets rescued there, there's actually a heck of a lot of people that successfully make it and you never hear about. Um, I mean, there's more people being rescued off the flat top than there are off this trail. Uh, there's a lot more people hiking the flat top too, but still, the, the point is is that the, the rescues get a lot more press than they would if there wasn't a bus from Into the Wild that had a movie made about it out there. Um, and that's something that uh, I mean, you can't really combat, I and mean, it makes good headlines, but uh, it's something to think about. And uh, we have just a few, a few more tips to cover. Uh, you know, be bear safe, wear bells, make noise. Um, just because I haven't seen them doesn't mean they're not there. And uh, bring either a bear-proof food container or, or hang your food. There's plenty of trees tall enough to hang your food uh, the whole way along if you're a little bit selective. Uh, Bring deep, the mosquitoes will pick you up and carry you away during most of the summer. I mean, they're, they're awful. Uh, and I've been a lot of places, and it's probably in like the top 5% of places I've been as far as terrible mosquitoes in the state. Um, we were out there, and when we were coming back, we ran into that group of like Australian guys, and they were like, oh, it's friggin' mozzies. <laughs> I didn't know that that's what they were called. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, again, do everything you can to prepare for the rivers if you're going. Um, other than that, uh, you know, thank you for coming and watching, and we wanted to open it up to any and all questions. Sure. I kind of uh, saved most of my questions for the end. First, I'd like to say thank you for coming here and having this class. I think it will really help educate people and kind of reduce the amount of statistics that people have to get rescued. But uh, you were sitting earlier, and I talked to you back in March about this, about wearing a trail runner type of shoe, something they can easily drain. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that versus uh, some sort of trail sandals like Keens or Tevas? Or would you I mean, that's up to those? what what is is personally comfortable for you. The the key is it's got to drain. Uh, waterproof is not waterproof. 
And even if it is, I mean, it, it just slows you down from having dry feet again. You're going to get them wet. I mean, unless you wear hip waders, and then you'll wish you didn't wear hip waders. <laughs> yeah, I wore yeah. waterproof boots, and I was wet the whole time. He ended up in sandals the, most of it with the first socks. Track, yeah. It looked ridiculous, but he pulled yeah. it off. Um, and I think he was by far more comfortable. I ended up with five or six blisters, and he had none. So, yeah, but it's at that point, it's personal preference. It's whichever one you're more I was wearing some heavy weight, like yeah. hunting boots, too, and that's not a good idea. My knees were killing me at the end of the trip. It's the weight. Because, yeah, just the weight and your hiking. I mean, for us, it was 40 miles round trip, and that's a lot of steps to take with fairly heavy boots. So I, I regretted doing that. I, I would have brought tennis shoes like my but sister you did. surgery like your sister. No, I guess surgery <laughs> like my sister, but still, yeah. They say that every pound on your feet is worth like three in your pack in terms of fatigue. So, you know, the lighter you can go. I'm not going to advocate going out there and like minimalist trail runners, but uh, or barefoot trail runners. But I mean, if that's your style and you can do that, it's probably better off. Um, oh yeah. Um, I was also going to say when we talked on the phone, you recommended making a three-day plan, uh, hiking from uh, eight mile out to the river and camping there that night, crossing about 5 a.m. in the morning, somewhere early in the morning, as you mentioned, the, uh, the river gets higher as it gets warmer. Um, and upon crossing on that day, we kind of toyed with the idea of dropping uh, some non-essential, non-scented gear, so keeping all your hygienic supplies and food on you, mm -hmm. but dropping maybe a tent, and just keeping a tent on us for emergency cases, just kind of lighten up our loads to get out to the bus and get back. Would you recommend that, or do you want to get to it? Um. There's risk involved in that, but like our, our first trip, 2009, uh, when we did that, we hiked in 10 miles the first day, across the river, camped, dropped everything besides food and water, went to the bus and back in a day. We actually left camp set up, which wasn't the smartest move. But. And then we, we went out the last day carrying all the gear, so we did that in three days. That, that worked out pretty well. Um, ideally, I think now probably the, the best thing to do is to do it in four days, so you're doing 10 miles a day. And how long did it take you to do it the time that you did it by yourself? 36 hours. <laughs> That's a long one. Yeah. Well, and I was carrying like a 70 pound pack on the way out and a 50 pound pack on the way back because I was setting a, a gear cache out there for a different trip. But um, We used to take, if you stash gear, we used to take uh, mothballs and, uh, and put them around the gear. And for some reason, you know, like vomits, especially uh, bears. Uh, they don't like them. They'll try to eat them, but they, it's not too good. And, and uh, you know, it's not great for the environment. You can pick them up on the, you know, if you want to go out. But it's something to protect it because yeah, all it is. takes is one bad luck. Yeah. yeah. And well, and you just, I mean, everything. there's people, we, somebody was just talking about somebody that made it out there. They were claiming like six or seven hours or something. I mean, so, and there's people that do it as a day hike. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not one of those people. I saw a gentleman on YouTube doing that, and it's just like he made it all the way up to the bus in a single day, and he ran into some people that were taking some outdoor, like, recreational vehicles in from another side, and he caught a ride out on the second day, so that was fortunate for him. But uh, Another question I have was, um, when you get to the tech, I've heard of multiple trail reports of people not being able to find the trail on the other side. Do you have anything yeah. you would, should look for on the other side? Yeah, I'll pull something up. Yeah. Um, Oh, this is way dark. That's not going to do as much good. Um, oh, there we yeah. go. We'll come in. So what happens, at least in most of those cases, where people are talking about losing the trail is uh, you're coming in at like this steep angle, and then right as you come to the riverbed, it kind of angles over like this, mm -hmm. and so it looks like the trail should be right here. Okay. But in reality. It's here. Oh, so if you cross right where the, the thing hits it and go directly across, you kind of have to walk up the bank until you see four-wheeler tracks heading, like they've eroded the bank out a little bit, and that's where you pick the trail back up. So it looks like there's a couple eddies on the uh, on the west side of it, and is, is that kind of what you're looking for as you walk down the river, is multiple, uh, I guess, drainage braids going into the river? Or? Um, I mean, if it's deep enough, it braids a lot more further this way. Okay get to where we can see that or not. But uh, this is really cruddy image. But 
Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, so you can see that's super pixelated, but there's actually spots where it breaks into like four grades. Okay. And I mean, I would think that under most circumstances, just depending on how much time and distance you were willing to lose, you could always go far enough up to find a spot where it's braided enough that you would be able to cross it. But uh, I mean, if it's going so hard that you're hearing the boulders rumbling along the bottom, you just can't walk that. You're going to get knocked down. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty much sums it up on mine. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. I like your top run. <laughs> I interviewed protein. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I was regretting that the next day too. I ate like three things of top ramen, but I don't know, it's still like 400 calories or something ridiculous. Yeah. And so the next day, like halfway through the day, I just could not move. I just sat down in the middle of the trail. I didn't even get off the trail, and I cooked up just a whole bunch of rice and beans and cheese and ate that and immediately felt better. <laughs> top ramen is not good camp food. <laughs> Has anyone slept in the bus that you know of? Has anybody what? Slept in the bus once they got there? Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, I wouldn't recommend it because that mattress is like all kinds of wires sticking out of it and I could pop my thermorest and I put on top of it. But, um, it's certainly available to you if you don't mind having wires in there. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and, I've, and uh, yeah, when when people see that, that I did that, I get I get different comments about that. You know, like you know, a guy died there, right? But uh, that was a while ago. I would <laughs> <laughs> and it it was also one o'clock in the morning, and I had just hiked the twenty miles, and uh, I had intended to sleep outside in a bivy sack that I brought with me. But by the time I got there, I just kind of laid down and didn't get up until the next day. <laughs> Is there a foundation or anything in memory of this kid? You know. Uh, there actually is a Christopher McCandless Foundation. And are you um, doing anything particular with money to the trail or? Nothing towards the trail. The it's, it's run by his parents. Yeah, it's, it's run by his parents. Uh -huh. And um, they haven't done anything towards the trail yet. It's mostly uh, like helping um, single moms kind of thing that they're doing with, with the money. I mean, it, like their proceeds that they got from uh, the movie and, uh -huh. and book and all that. That's all have fun. Wow. <clears throat> That's it. Oh. Good job. Thank you. Any other questions or pretty much wrapped up?